For the past 25 years, I have been trying to promote international cooperation in managing shared stocks of fish in the ocean. And to be successful in this endeavor, I have needed, like my colleagues from other governments, to rely on the scientists and the researchers to teach us, even if I didn't exactly speak their language. And I have noticed that their language over the period of time I'm talking about has actually changed a bit. When I started off in this business in the early 1990s, most fisheries at the national level, even especially at the international level, were managed as single species, as if no other species interacted with them. And over time, we have improved upon that model rather significantly, thanks largely to the scientists and researchers of the sort you will hear about here from this evening. We have developed what sometimes called an ecosystem-based approach to fisheries and management at the national level, also now more and more at the international level. And we have begun in fits and starts taking into account socioeconomic aspects as well. Um, and so uh, for the Arctic in particular, um, fisheries management is changing. And indeed, in some ways, it is a new ocean that is opening up, not so much in this part of the Arctic, but uh, north of here, particularly in the Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, and while, uh, while this is daunting, we also actually have a chance to get it right. We can, if we're smart, avoid some of the mistakes of fisheries management that have been committed too often in the past. But to do so, we really do need to listen to the people and their colleagues who will be presenting this evening. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to the moderator to introduce our panel. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much uh, for these uh, introductory words. And uh, it is indeed a changing world uh, out there. Uh, we have today uh, a panel of four speakers, and they will come up here and give their speeches and then sit down in the audience so they can watch the other panelists. Uh, towards the end, they will then join us here up at the panel where we were able to ask questions. But uh, before I actually do the formal introduction of the panel, uh, we were going to have a short introduction uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Diekman, uh, who was going to talk to us about the modeling, if I was correct. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. I just wanted to give you about three minutes of the logic of this session to put the different talks we have assembled into context. So the world of fishery science is expanding its scope. It's actually an exciting time to be a fishery scientist because so much more is coming onto the plate and so much more is possible to be synthesized, integrated and uh, treated in a more holistic way than has been done in the past. And this is also where the mission of our institute, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, offers a good match. We try to take a system thinking view on many problems um, facing humankind. So as uh, Dave has actually very nicely highlighted, it's only just 20 years ago that much fisheries assessment was based on single stocks. A focus on a single stock seemed good enough at that time. And it took about two decades of heavy prodding and very gradual and to some extent sluggish development to enter the age of ecosystem-based management, which is now regarded as a state of the art. And even that is not fully implemented in all the practices and protocols. Um, there's still an ongoing pro process to reflect that. So that's great, and it's a big improvement on, um, on how it was uh, dealt just a few decades ago. But there are many additional challenges, and I would like to highlight uh, four of them, which uh, miraculously match the four speakers we have uh, selected for the panel. So the first uh, of these, which are still to be implemented, are the evolutionary dimensions of fishing. Fishing is not only changing the numbers of sea, uh, the number of fish in the sea, but is also altering their trades, and that needs to be part of sustainable management um, assessments. Secondly, and uh, this is partly happening but not yet enough, the socioeconomic perspectives, uh, 
utility components related to employment, to coastal communities, uh, but also to, to profit and costs have to be integrated. And that takes us smoothly into the recognition of the heterogeneity of the stakeholder communities uh, faced with managing fish stocks. The stakeholder objectives are not so easily integrated into one utility function that a manager could use. So how to do that and how to reconcile the potential conflicts of interest is an important question that also fishery scientists have to work with. And finally, all this has to be further integrated in a cross-sectoral view where the food that comes from fishing is uh, looked at jointly with the food that comes from other sources that takes us into issues of land use management, of energy, food and fiber, food and energy. All these nexus topics then also become part of the remit of fishery sciences. And uh, the first speaker um, will be dealing with uh, ecology and evolution. That's Miko Haino. Then we have uh, societal objectives. I will say a little bit about that. Stakeholder objectives, Rachel Tiller, and uh, cross-sectoral embedding. We have Peter Havlik. And I leave it now to the speakers to detail all these comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Dickman. And uh, as he has introduced the areas we're going to be talking about and the speakers, I will simply introduce each speaker uh, before their session. We have to be mindful of time, so I will be sitting there in the corner looking at you diligently while the talk is ongoing. And uh, I will signal you when uh, there are two minutes left. And if I stand up, it's about time to step down. If I stand beside you, I will be throwing you off the podium very quickly. Uh, there are about 10 minutes uh, that we have per each uh, presentation so that we have some time to have discussion here towards the end. But the uh, first presentation uh, is on ecology and evol e evolution of sustainable exploitation of fish stocks. And to give that lecture is Miko Haino. Dr. Miko Haino is a professor in fisheries biology at the University of Bergen in Norway. And he is a principal scientist at the Institute of Marine Research, and also a senior research uh, scholar at the Interna International Institute for Applied System Analysis, or IASA, as I will call it from now, now on. Uh, he obtained his, obtained his PhD degree from the University of Helsinki in, in Finland in 1998, and is a population and evolutionary biologist uh, working with both fundamental and applied aspects of life history evolution and population dynamics. And population dynamics are extremely difficult part of uh, the whole systematic approach. Much of his work also relates to the evolution and sustainable exploitation of fish stocks in the North Atlantic. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Hein, please. Okay, thank you very much. So first I would like just to point out that uh, even though we don't necessarily associate the Arctic uh, with big fisheries, actually we find uh, some of the world's uh, biggest fisheries in that area, at least if we use these slightly broader definitions of Arctic. So in the North Pacific, we have uh, Alaska Pollock, uh, which is uh, always in the top three of uh, uh, global catches. Uh, then uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, we have a close relative Atlantic uh, cod, also major fishery species, and which I will use uh, further in this talk for examples. Uh, and then we have two pelagic species in the uh, northern Atlantic, uh, capelin and Atlantic uh, herring, which are uh, also very important species, even though capelin is not the ten, top ten right now. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, many other stocks that uh, are of uh, more local importance, uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, stocks that uh, might be migrating towards this area in, in the near future. So, so what is uh, sustainability? Well, the simple uh, definition is that uh, present use should not uh, harm future use and uh, benefits that we get from these exploited uh, resources. So, so basically, what we do today should not make uh, tomorrow worse. A and that's a fairly permissive uh, definition. So, so note that uh, in this definition there's no idea that the benefits should be optimized. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in this more 
normative uh, international uh, framework, uh, we have a bit more stringent uh, requirements. So starting from uh, United Nations uh, law of the sea, and then uh, in, in the Johannesburg uh, Declaration from uh, 2002, and most lately the future, we want uh, uh, declaration from the United Nations General Assembly in 2012, uh, we put uh, much uh, higher goals. So this uh, specific phrasing is from the law of the sea. So the goal is to maintain or restore, uh, restore populations of harvested species at levels that can produce uh, maximum sustainable yield. So what does that mean? Well, uh, the stock level that would produce uh, maximum sustainable yield, it, based on simple models, uh, is somewhere between uh, 30 to 50 percent of uh, pristine uh, biomass. So, this is my first take home message. A actually, that the stock is reduced uh, to quite, uh, quite a bit below the pristine levels is, is not uh, necessarily a bad sign. At least under this simple objective, uh, it can be actually a sign of uh, success. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you think of the stock reduced to 30% of uh, pristine levels, that's quite a marked uh, reduction already. Mm, however, these numbers are based on uh, fairly simple models. So, so the classic theory of fishing is uh, based on uh, models that uh, essentially treat uh, fish as a biomass that live in a void. It's a, a enclosed void, so it's a void with the limits, but still it's a void. So, so basically we are saying that uh, it doesn't matter whether one ton of fish consists of uh, 10,000 uh, small fish or uh, 100 uh, big fish. Is this a good starting point? Well, uh, there are a number of uh, challenges, and uh, as Ambassador Bolton already uh, hinted, and uh, Dr. Dietmann continued, one important dimension are these uh, species uh, interactions. So, so basically, a resource species uh, will be interacting uh, with its prey, and it's also likely to be a prey itself to other species. Another challenge is the demographic uh, structure. It actually matters uh, what is the demographic composition of uh, a resource population. And third, we have the uh, trade evolution. So, so over time, uh, exploitation can lead to changes in inherited characteristics of uh, uh, these populations. So I, I will address these three briefly. So what about these ecological interactions? Well, uh, exploitation uh, means that we reduce the numbers of a certain species. And that's uh, good news for those species that uh, are competing, competing with the focal species. And it's also good news uh, for those species that our focal species is uh, preying upon. However, uh, it is bad news uh, for those species that use our focal species as a resource. A and these uh, effects are not limited to the species that are directly interacting with the focal resource species. These effects can cascade uh, further on in a food web. So basically, my enemy's enemy is my friend. And these things are observed. So the take-home uh, message here is that uh, exploiting a single stock will always have broader ecosystem-level effects. And uh, if we try to pretend that we can uh, harvest single or a couple stock as if they were independent, uh, we may find uh, surprises. This is an example from the Barents Sea. Mm. So, so basically here we have a cod as a most valuable commercial species and capelin is the most important uh, prey species. So, so now we cannot uh, pretend that we can fish uh, capelin as we wish and at the same time uh, freely uh, take maximum uh, catch of uh, cod. Because uh, if we want to have a good catch of cod we have to leave uh, capelin uh, as its uh, food. And this is actually exactly how K 
Capelin is managed at the moment. So it's f first and foremost a, a resource for cod to eat, and then only if there's sufficient excess, it's uh, used as a fish resource itself. Of course, uh, uh, you will see that uh, this uh, graph has a lot more interactions that are not uh, explicitly accounted. So I, I would uh, challenge the previous speakers and would actually claim that uh, most of this uh, accounting for these species actions, uh, interactions is mostly words. It's not really entering the operational management. And a, and a further note I would like to make is that uh, it, it's quite typical that uh, Arctic uh, ecosystems have uh, s uh, simple food webs. And in these simple food webs, uh, these uh, interactions between uh, a species pair tends to be more strong, so, so more pronounced effects can be expected. Okay, then what about the demographic uh, structure? So, so, so basically, exploitation will lead to more mortality. That's what it is. And, uh, but mortality risk is a, something that is uh, cumulative. So to survive to old age, you have to survive all previous years. And, and this means that uh, if there's more mortality, average age in, in population will decline. And as a consequence, also average uh, uh, size. And this is just the inevitable consequence of uh, exploiting a population. And um, this can have uh, unforeseen demographic and ecological consequences. This is an example from uh, Barents Sea, which is uh, it's a graph showing average age and size of uh, Barents Sea cod over a period of some uh, 70 years. And we see a quite uh, marked decline towards uh, a lower age and size. So, so, so basically, a mechanistic uh, consequence of um, harvesting is that we have a fewer uh, big old fish, both in absolute and uh, relative numbers. So finally, what about uh, evolution? Mm, that uh, fishing can select for uh, uh, traits is most uh, easy to see if you think of uh, uh, traits that uh, directly affect uh, capture, such as uh, here illustrated for a troll. So what can uh, a fish do to avoid uh, capture? Well, uh, it can uh, swim up or to the sides. Similarly, we have a mesh size selection uh, in, in gillnets. Uh, individuals that are uh, small enough may be slipping through. Uh, and the same uh, mesh size selection will happen in, in a trawl. So we can have a selection on uh, traits like uh, size and uh, behavior. What is maybe a bit more difficult to see is that we also have a strong selection on, on traits that are related to temporal trade-offs. So, so basically, whether an individual is investing its resources to reproduction now or investing them something else that helps uh, future reproduction. And, and this kind of trade-off are very sensitive to mortality. So if there's more mortality, future becomes uh, unimportant. And, and this is uh, actually exactly how also we humans are behaving. For example, e education is an investment to future. But uh, people invest in education only if it's uh, likely to pay off. So during the times of uh, crisis uh, wars, uh, people don't care about uh, uh, spending uh, five years in the university. They want to live their lives uh, today. However, of course, fish are not uh, being educated, uh, but there are other uh, temporal trade-offs that are important. And uh, I would like to highlight the last one here. So it's uh, between current reproduction and, and growth. Because growth is an investment to future. Big fish have uh, fewer enemies, and they are also a lot more fecund. And there are two traits in particular which can then uh, respond. Uh, we have a timing of uh, maturation and also how much uh, reproduction takes place. And the more there is a reproduction, the less there is a growth. Mm, I'll uh, illustrate this with this uh, example of a uh, cod from the Barents Sea. Here we have a very marked uh, changes in the timing of uh, reproduction. So both the age at the first reproduction and the size at the first reproduction have been gone, going down markedly. 
uh, and why? Well, it's most likely a mixture of different uh, effects. And uh, these demographic effects and environmental effects, they are not really contested. What, what is uh, more controversial, whether it could be also an evolutionary response. Uh, and we, together with Ulf Dickmann and uh, Ulf Neguda, have developed a technique to tease them apart. And basically, this uh, analysis showed that the underlying tendency to mature has changed uh, in a way which is uh, suggesting evolutionary change. So, to wrap up, so fishing has uh, profound uh, demographic consequences and ecological consequences. And basically, how to deal with this and achieve sustainable fishery is something that we more or less know, even though we don't necessarily always put it in practice. But uh, what the research during the last uh, 10, 15 years has shown that uh, fishing has also these evolutionary effects, which uh, are a bit uh, slower to happen, but still can happen at uh, time scales of a few decades. And this is both good and bad news. It probably makes uh, fish stocks uh, more robust to fishing, but at the same time it probably makes them uh, less robust to natural variations and also less uh, valuable resources because uh, stocks become uh, less uh, productive and consist of uh, smaller specimens. A and here the path uh, to sustainability is still, still something that uh, we are working on. We don't have all the answers. Yeah, with that uh, remark, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Heinel. Uh, as if it wasn't complex enough, we now figure out the animals can actually adapt to the models that we have finally figured out for, for decades. So this is, this is very interesting. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ulf, uh, Dr. Ulf Digman, uh, who gave our introduction here earlier. Uh, he uh, directs the Evolution and Ecology, Ecology Program at the IASA. He received, he received his uh, bachelor's in physics and uh, master's degree in theoretical physics from the University of Aachen in Germany, and completed his PhD research on theoretical biology at uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, and he obtained a habilitation, Venia Legenti, Legenti, in biomathematics from the University of Vienna. He has worked at Stanford University and the Ciros Palo Alto Research Center in USA, and the research center uh, Julich, Germany, at the and the University of York in UK, Leiden University in the Netherlands, and the University of Vienna in Austria. So, Dr. Digman, please step up. Yeah, thank you very much again for the kind introduction, Eilfur. Um, I would like now to take us from the biological world, which, as Miko has explained, is already complex enough and offers quite some subtleties, into the world of societal objectives and diversity of stakeholder interests. Let me start with a reminder about the complexity of fishery systems. We start from the natural system, which prominently includes a target stock, which then renders ecosystem services to society, which form the basis for management decisions about how to deal with fisheries and the stock. These management measures impact the socioeconomic system, not only the fishers, but also um, the processes and retailers, prominently the consumers, and more in general, they are affected by the socioeconomic environment. And that finally feeds back in terms of fishing pressure onto the target stock. So we have to capture this uh, complexity, which is not easy. There are essentially no models at all that can capture all of these dimensions at once. But at least we have to combine the biological with the social to do justice to that nexus displayed in this graph. So let me um, <clears throat> make a few initial statements on that. So societies have diverse interests in the ecosystem services rendered by fisheries. That is uh, also recognized by the by the, by the diversity of ecosystem services as described by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And then within society, stakeholder groups differ in their preferences, often strongly leading to highly polarized debates about how to manage fish stocks. 
So quantitative assessments of biological stock dynamics have been well developed for decades, but in contrast, accounting for non-biological objectives if, is often left to a political process, which is not bad as such, but that means it's not backed up by quantitative assessments, and that, I think, is not ideal. So in the longer term, I think we need integrative quantitative assessments that do justice both to the biological and to the non-biological aspects of fisheries. And I would like to give you two examples in this talk uh, for how to achieve that. I mean, these are kind of proof of principle that it's actually not so difficult and it's surprising how little resources which are invested around the globe into fishery science go into these integrative studies. So the first example is about how to deal with alternative societal objectives. And for that we have focused on Northeast Arctic Cod, or Barents Sea Cod, as uh, Miko called it, um, which is arguably one of the most valuable and precious fish stocks uh, that is accessible in European waters. And um, as you see here with these two circles, we combine a biological model with an economic model. So the biological model uh, deals with the aspect that Miko has described, actually including evolution, and the economic model then is uh, linked in terms of yield and costs, in terms of demand and sales prices, in terms of field profit and field, uh, fleet dynamics, and then that leads to supply and the number of vessels uh, and the quota per vessel that then is um, imposed on the fishing fleet. And this is coupled by the so-called harvest control rule. You might know fishery science is moving away from annual haggling over quotas to long-term management plans, which are taking the form of harvest control rules. Here's the one that is in effect for the last uh, roughly 10 years for Northeast Arctic Cod, negotiated between Norway and Russia. It's a very simple diagram. On the horizontal axis, you have the adult biomass in the sea. On the vertical axis, you have the permissible fishing pressure, fishing mortality, and they are linked by this hockey stick shape uh, relationship. So that means that as the stock is uh, is available in the sea, the fishing pressure is ramped up linearly up to a ceiling and then it stays at that ceiling. Very simple, but it means that every year the assessment can be put into this graph and the fishing pressure can be read off and there's a kind of longer term consensus about how to manage the stock than uh, has been the case in the past. Now, how was this hockey stick graph derived? The answer is it was actually not derived. It was uh, politically negotiated with expert input. And um, we try to go beyond that and construct a quantitative model that allows us to devise the optimal harvest control rule given alternative societal objectives. So we built a process-based model, which, as I said, couples the individual-based biological assumptions with an economic model. And now we test it three alternative societal objectives. So here's the current harvest control rule. The first objective we tested is profit maximization. How should politicians choose this harvest control rule if they wanted to give the highest profit to the fishing industry? Here's the answer. It's kind of indistinguishable from the current harvest control rule. So it turns out that maybe unwittingly or maybe very wisely the politicians got it just right for serving the fishing industry. Okay. Now, the next uh, alternative um, measure you could choose, and many economists would argue that this is the right measure for politicians to target, that is the social welfare maximization that includes both the profit for the fishing industry and the so-called consumer surplus in the form of uh, reasonably priced access to, uh, to this resource. And uh, you see that this yields an optimal harvest control which is slightly more aggressive than the profit maximization one, which uh, does away with the romantic notion that uh, avoiding profit maximization is always best for sustainability. In this case, actually, it's the self-interest of the fishing industry that does result in a more conservative exploitation. And then, as uh, Miko was pointing out, the World Summit on uh, Sustainable Development, Johannesburg 2002, mandated that all stocks be managed according to maximum sustainable yield. So here we talk about yield as a metric to optimize, and you see it yields an even more aggressive harvest control rule. Uh, I think this is unexpected to many. There's a kind of notion out there that yield maximization yields very, um, 
very conservative exploitation. That is actually not the case when you look at the quantitative model assessment of this. With that, I would like to come to the second example, which now goes into the diversity of stakeholder interests and recognizes that actually it's often very hard to come up with a single objective or single uh, target for politicians to optimize. This goes back to a famous notion that uh, Ray Hilborn, one of the luminaries of fishery science, has introduced a decade ago, the so-called zone of new consensus. All of you will be familiar with this textbook graph about uh, natural resource exploitation. As you crank up the fishing pressure from zero, when of course you have no yield, you come to a yield maximum and then you start to overfish and eventually the population might crash. So yield maximization means being at the top of this curve. Then you want to compare that with uh, the, the impact on employment and roughly, qualitatively speaking, employment goes up with fishing effort, whether linearly or not. Um, Profit peaks to the left of yield because there are costs. So the optimal profit is achieved at a slightly uh, smaller yield, but much smaller fishing effort than the maximum yield. And then finally, you have ecosystem preservation considerations, which tend to uh, imply a degradation with fishing effort. So the more you hit the stock, the worse it is for the ecosystem. So based on this very qualitative picture, but it's, it's multidimensional, and that is, I think, the advance. Hilborn argued that the zone of traditional fisheries management has been on the far right of the yield curve, driven by the concern about employment. So the lobby of the fishing industry has pressurized politicians into that zone, whereas, he argues, maybe we should uh, be on the left side of the yield peak, uh, which he calls the zone of new consensus, which is not far away from profit maximization, but also very good from the perspective of ecosystem preservation. So we wanted to test these ideas in an integrative quantitative model for which we combine three components, a biological model, a socioeconomic model, and a stakeholder model. And especially in the stakeholder model, we account for the pluralistic or heterogeneous perspectives that stakeholders have on the question. So this is uh, the matrix of stakeholder preferences that we assumed for this exercise, which is based on informal interviews and reading the literature. So we considered five alternative stakeholder groups, the industrial fishes, the artisanal or small-scale fishers, then politicians which are very much employment-oriented, so kind of traditional politicians, and others that are maybe more geared towards profit maximization in the spirit of the zone of new consensus, and then NGOs like, like Greenpeace and others that are focusing primarily on ecosystem preservation and are not uh, primarily interested in profits for the fishing industry. So we try to assign weights to these stakeholders and to the utility components I have mentioned, namely yield, employment, profit, and preservation. So with that, we can now probe how different management strategies would affect these stakeholders through these utility components provided by our model. And if we now ask, what, is what, 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 is, what, what did Hilborn really mean with this zone of new consensus? I mean, here's a caricature of that. If you have a control space of a complex system, uh, as illustrated by this grid, and then one stakeholder group wants to be in the blue area, the other wants to be in the red area, then consensus between these stakeholders is most likely in the intersection. It's a very basic, very um, pedestrian insight. So we have to find this intersection now in the control space of, uh, of the stocks. And um, I should emphasize we did this for two stocks in order to avoid falling into some idiosyncrasies. Uh, the Capelin stock um, also um, harvested by the Norwegian fishing fleet and the cod stock. And the two control options that are here on the axis are the harvest proportion. That's what you read about in the press. It's about quotas. How much is allowed to, is, is, it, is it allowed to fish in total? And on the vertical axis, you have a measure which is less talked about. It's called a technical measure, which already makes it a bit boring, but it's very important. It's about the minimum size limit that fishermen are expected to respect through their gears. So when you have the, the mesh size of gears, it's not allowed to have a very fine mesh. Uh, the young and small fish must be allowed to slip through, so there's a minimum size um, of these meshes, and that's regulated by law. So now you see that in this two-dimensional space, 
uh, there are zones of what we call joint stakeholder satisfaction. The lighter the color, the more the least satisfied of the five stakeholder groups is doing. Yeah? So the, 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 the lighter the color, the least satisfied stakeholder group is most happy. This is a kind of Rawlsian ethics to care most about the least satisfied or most disadvantaged stakeholder group. So we thought that was quite a conservative assumption. I could also go for an arithmetic mean of their utilities, but we wanted to be more conservative than that. Now, in these zones of um, new consensus, which we have colored here in green, even the least satisfied stakeholder gets 70% or 90% respectively of the maximum possible total utility. Right? It's, it's as good as that. You, you, you want to get 100% of course, but even the least satisfied ones get 70% or 90%, so that's pretty good. Where are we currently? The status quo for Kaplan and Cod is displayed here, and it's not so far off in the horizontal direction. So the quotas don't matter so much. It is really the vertical direction that is crucial. So politicians would be well advised, we believe, to um, make the um, minimum mesh size regulations, the uh, minimum size limits, more strict, and to mandate larger meshes, larger gears to fish, then everybody would have a higher benefit from these two stocks. And with that, I come to the conclusions of this talk. Um, I hope this has shown how new methods help integrate non-biological objectives into quantitative assessments of fishery systems. And this reveals some surprises that might not be amenable to uh, qualitative reasoning without the use of quantitative assessments. So first, regarding societal, societal objectives, it turns out that profit maximization is not maximally aggressive, as many people think, and yield maximization is not minimally aggressive, as many people think. And secondly, regarding stakeholder objectives, reconciliation is probably more realistic than portrayed by polarized public debates, and focusing on quotas alone might be misleading. We have to focus on minimum size regulations more prominently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dickman, and uh, quite interesting indeed uh, this uh, new approach with regard to taking into the stakeholder account into the modeling. Now we get to the third lecture, uh, which is uh, held by Dr. Uh, Rachel Tiller. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science uh, with a focus on marine and coastal interdisciplinary research at all levels, levels of analysis, analysis from local stakeholder perceptions to international management regimes. So her expertise is in regime interplay, governance, policy mit mitigation, and stakeholder-driven future uh, scenario building and adaptive capacity. Her background also includes participating in and leading uh, national and international interdisciplinary uh, projects. She is a Fulbright Scholar and a recipient of the Leif Eriksson Mobility Fund. She is also the Norwegian representative on the management committee of the Cost Action, Ocean Governance for Sustainability. Looking forward to hear your talk. Please. Wonderful, yeah. As he said, my name is Rachel Tiller, and uh, I am going to be talking about stakeholders also. Uh, in this talk, though, the stakeholders will be real. All right, so they're not, this is based on actual interviews. So one of my complaints about a lot of these models is that we're assuming a lot about these stakeholders. Uh, and very often, it helps just talking to them and asking them. So instead of like going through this really long and redundant title that's up there, that's putting me to sleep, uh, I'll uh, tell a little bit about the project that this relates to. It's, a, it's an EU project uh, about the biological pump. And usually when I have this talk, I have this to political scientists, and I feel a lot more confident about talking about the biological pump. <laughs> But now I probably have a lot of biologists. But the aim of this project is, in short, it's to, do I have this? Does this work? Which one is it? This? Yes. So it's, uh, it's basically about climate change, how the ocean absorbs about 30% of all the anthropogenic uh, CO2, or are the CO2 in the atmosphere. And with this uh, absorption, you get a lot of changes to 
the water. Now one of the things that's in the water here is the biological pump. And the biological pumps act as a natural carbon capture mechanism in the ocean. So we want the carbon pump to keep working. So what we did in this project was we wanted to look at a number of a number of different stressors to see how they would affect the biological pump under different scenarios. Uh, so we have all these climatic stressors, non-climatic stressors. Uh, we've had a lot of cruises. We've had um, mesocosm experiments in three different oceans. And we've had a lot of stakeholder interviews. So for the purposes of this um, presentation, I'm going to be talking about the stakeholder interviews that we did in northern Norway on fisheries. Uh, we did, however, also have a lot of stakeholder interviews with the tourism sector, the aquaculture sector, and we did them in Patagonia in Chile, and we did them in Turkey as well. So we had a very big and encompassive uh, global perspective to this, and the aim of the project was to develop uh, a decision support system that took into consideration stakeholders' preferences and their perceptions of how these stressors affecting the biological pump, how they, that would affect them. So, oh, sorry. So, what happens though is that when you incorporate the socioeconomic information into this, I mean, we do interviews, we have big workshops, and we have a lot of narratives and a lot of data. So, how do you put these into mathematical models, right? So, part of what I'm going to be presenting here today is how we actually translated all of our data from these workshops into equations that the mathematical models could use to actually come up with decisions for policymakers. Because as Ulf also says, you have the current policies that are so far removed from what models perhaps say are optimal. Well, in this project we wanted to see, well, what if we push these results to the stakeholders and based on the workshops, they can tell us how they would react or how that would affect them. And that way you might actually find out whether or not there's anything you can do to mitigate it or to help them adapt to these changes. Uh, may your stocks be as plentiful as ours. All the fish is coming north, right, under climate change. We've had all these talks during these last few days. Stocks are changing, uh, and some are predicting that as many as 800 fish stocks could be moving northwards, right? So one of the things we thought coming into these workshops with these uh, stakeholders was that they must be really excited about this, right? We're getting so much fish. And it turns out they're not at all happy about this because of a simple thing. They don't have quotas for them, and they're not going to be able to afford the quotas. So what we wanted to do, though, we, we sat them down and we said, well, okay, so these are different stressors. Like, these are the different things that could happen to uh, your fishery in these areas under different climate change scenarios. So tell us how that works, right? I don't expect you to read this, uh, but what we have here is we first started with this horrendogram, right, where you just have them tell us everything, how they're going to be affected, in any way they're going to be affected. Uh, so up here we had seven stressors, and it's like change in pH and change in uh, sea surface temperature and all these different variables, and say, well, how is that going to affect you? And based on what they came up with here, we developed a Bayesian belief network. Uh, and that Bayesian belief network is what we used to develop the scenarios. I'm going to show you this here. This was what turned out to be their main issue. This is what they were the most worried about when it came to climate change. We tried going into the biological pump, but that turned out to be a little bit too complicated. So we ended up with climate change and changing sea surface temperature as being a proxy for the biological pump changing. Uh, so what you see here is using Bayesian belief network. They said that new species or migratory paths in order for their future within this scenario to be, for them to be able to work as fishers, uh, they would have to be given access to these new fisheries. That was their only adaptive capacity within that setting. So if they were not given th that access, their, their uh, adaptive capacity as fishers would be very small. So what we did then is we backcasted, which means that, well, so this is your preferred future. How are we going to get to that, right? So then you have three different. They say, well, management has to be updated. They want management to know what was going on. 
They wanted there to be enough capital. It costs money to buy these quotas. They need to refurbish their fish, not their ships, right? They were already talking about, at this time, how the mackerel was already up there, and the mackerel was chasing away their fish. And they couldn't even do anything about it. They couldn't even get bycatch, right? So instead, what they noticed was that the big ships from the south that had quotas on mackerel were coming up there. And they were harvesting the mackerel and catching their fish in the process. And they could afford it to, catch, to get that fine. But they could not. They were coastal fishers. So I said they needed the capital. They needed to change their vessels. They needed the quotas. And they also needed there to be a large enough market. Remember, this is like in a setting where we have, you know, hundreds of new fish stocks coming in. There needed to be a market for all this fish. And then this moved on down. Like, then again, how are we going to get the market? How are you going to get to be the ability to community? Like, how are you going to get capital? And how are you going to get good management? So all of this turns into... Uh, a lot of scenarios where they, in the end, get to basically put a probability of how likely it is that their scenarios will come true. Uh, in general, they were pretty negative, as you can see. They pretty much did not think this was going to happen. Uh, they had no faith in this new future that was coming and that they were going to get access. They were fairly negative to their own adaptive capacity. Uh, and we ended up taking this to a next step, though, we went in and we did fuzzy cognitive mapping on this. We went through and looked at all the data we had, all the narratives we had, and we translated that into a fuzzy cognitive map. And the reason why we translated it was because we needed to start making that step towards the, the model. And that goes into the red and the blue lines there. Because the red and the blue lines are the weighing. We've been weighing how, how important these different variables were to them. So a blue line will be a, a positive, and the red will be a negative. So a plus three would be, have a very negative effect. So if you look at this next one here, these two were actually the two variables that they, with all the narratives and the, the, two, different, um, and the two different models, these were the two variables that they felt had the most effect in the future for them. It was the power of the aquaculture industry in the municipality, and that might sound strange, but in Norway, aquaculture is a very important industry. And if there's aquaculture in the water where they usually fish, they cannot fish there. Uh, so if the uh, municipality is a municipality that favors aquaculture, they did not think that would have a very, that would not be positive for them. And sea surface temperature is the SST. So as we translated this into pluses and minuses, we also had to make equations, and that's when I started going on Facebook, because this is where I just had to time out. Uh, I don't do equations, but basically for every single one of these, water quality, jellyfish, power of aquaculture industry, we had to have a corresponding equation, and we had to have the data that may, would enable this to be able to be measured. So this was a big collaborative effort where we had the economists, we had the biologists, we had the microbiologists, the chemists. We were all sitting there together for days at end trying to come get this narrative into numbers. Uh, the biggest part about doing this is that you have to come to a point where all the scientists at least respect each other and are able to understand each other's languages. I mean, because we can say a word like community, and I will mean people, and people like Miko will be talking about fish. Right? So, so it's about learning how to communicate with each other and understanding uh, the different definitions. But what this all ends up into is basically a decision support system. So uh, Ulf, it's already existing. We made it. It's there. Uh, it's a decision support system that's basically based on, based on modules. We have them for Norway, Chile, and uh, Turkey. And it's based on the three different uh, stakeholder groups, fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism. Uh, and it has all these elements that I talked about now. It has the lower trophic levels, the higher trophic levels, it has the chemical speciation, uh, uh, looking at how these different elements all affect each other. And then based on the different scenarios that this comes out with, uh, we can see how the stakeholders in these different communities see that affecting their system. Now what that's good for is that it actually is a decision support. We're not telling the policymakers what to do. But it's saying, well, you know, if sea surface te uh, temperature increases that much, it'll lead to more jellyfish, which will clog up the nets of the fishermen, which means that we need measures in place to take care of the jellyfish, or we need to enable them to harvest jellyfish, 
right? So this, in this way, we can actually have, based on their perceptions, an ability to give the policymakers a support system. And it's also possible to expand it to new areas, new everything. So we're presenting this in a couple of weeks, the final version, so I'm not gonna show it to you live because I don't, can't. Uh, but if you wanna know more about it, it's the website, oceancertain.eu. And uh, that's it, and I think I'm on time. <laughs> Thank you so much, and yes, excellent, excellent timing. Then we go to our fourth and uh, last uh, lecture, given by Dr. Havlik, Peter Havlik, uh, which received his master's in economics in, and management in 2001. That was early this century. Uh, and uh, e economics of agriculture and agriculture business and rural development in 2002, from the Mental University of Agriculture and Forestry in I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, but it's in the Czech Republic. Uh, and in the, uh, at the University of Montpellier. And from these two institutions, uh, under double supervision, he re received his PhD in 2006. Before joining IASA in 2007, he worked at the uh, INRI, Quignon, in France. And his research interest includes forest and agricultural sector uh, optimization models uh, and optimization models. He leads the Globium model development team and supervises the development of fisheries uh, and agriculture uh, component. And the title of his uh, talk is An Integrated Economic Model of Global Fisheries, Agriculture and Agriculture. So I assume that you're going to integrate all three talks that we have seen so far. Thank you very much for the introduction, Chairman. I am happy that you uh, mentioned that my major interests are in agriculture and forests, and that's also why this is a joint presentation of my colleague, uh, Miro Batka, and myself, uh, while Miro Batka is our expert in the uh, fish markets modeling, actually with experience from the International Food and Resource Policy Institute in Washington, where he was working on this for about uh, 10 years. So I will give you a little bit of background uh, from my comfort zone. So uh, the history is that indeed when I joined IASA 10 years ago, we started to develop this model called uh, Globium. And we already by then called it quite pretentiously uh, the global biosphere management model uh, with a little bit of intuition that at some point it would be necessary to include uh, fisheries and aquaculture into the picture. But by then we were already happy that we were integrating two uh, very important sectors for the land use component, which is agri agriculture and forestry. And so this model is an economic model, a partial equilibrium model, but besides being a well-recognized nowadays economic model, uh, it also has a specificity that it relies on a very detailed representation of the biophysical realities, on the one hand in terms of resource availability, like land, uh, water, and so on, but also in terms of parameterization of the different production activities. So we parameterize the production activities by means of biophysical process-based models, which allows to get information not only about the input-output relationships based on standard commercial inputs, but also gives you a whole range uh, of environmental indicators ranging from, for, for example, crops, uh, carbon balances, uh, nutrient balances, water balances, related GAG emissions, and so on. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of flavor for what uh, this model can be useful for, uh, so among the output variables which we have there, so on the economic side, it's a indeed standard uh, market equilibrium model, uh, which has endogenous production, processing, uh, and consumption quantities, uh, the commodity and resource prices. Uh, it represents quite well the international trade flows, which I understand are also quite important for the fishery sector, which is actually much more traded than agricultural products themselves. Then there are these environmental variables, which I talked briefly about. So on the one hand, land use by activity and production system, uh, land cover and uh, land cover change. So the model covers, in a way, the whole uh, land surface, not only the productive activities. 
water use, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, that's a recent development, uh, and also social variables. So there we made some progress in converting these standard market variables into, for example, food security uh, indicators. And so, uh, what are the standard areas of implementation of such a model? So, on the one hand, is the indeed agricultural and forest market, forest side, and different scenario development. Particularly, our team has a very long history in all different types of greenhouse gas. Uh, reduction, climate change mitigation uh, assessments. So there we are working really on a broad range from on the one hand very regionalized studies such as working with the Brazilian government or the European Commission and helping them developing uh, the mitigation policies in the agricultural and forest sectors uh, up to integration with the energy system model within IASA uh, to develop the overall uh, deep decarbonization uh, strategies and taking care of the land use part there. Then, of course, we have heard just in the previous presentation about the climate change impacts on, on, aqua on fisheries and aquaculture, and this is equally important topic uh, for us in the agriculture. Uh, and then, last but not least, it came as the last, but is very big now, uh, at IASA. So we are very much involved also in all the discussions around the Sustainable Development Goals. And actually the model by already its uh, scope is relevant for, for quite a few of them. And we are trying to expand further the relevance. So, but we have a little problem. <laughs> uh, if we look at uh, the species and the livestock, which I like personally a lot, uh, we are becoming a minority compared to the aquaculture and fisheries production. So these lines uh, probably are very well known to you. This blue line represents the historical developments in agriculture, the light blue, uh, in aquaculture, the light blue. And this dark one represents the historical developments in the capture uh, fisheries. And here these little icons compare these quantities of the fish with the quantities of the production of beef, but actually maybe even more surprisingly poultry and pork. And so even when we disaggregate uh, the aquaculture and fisheries into these two groups, we are comparable to these very big categories uh, for the nutrition. So uh, this is one of the clear reasons when we want to say something reasonable about food. And nowadays nutrition security, we have to take into account properly uh, the fish component. And the second aspect is, of course, that uh, as we have seen in the previous uh, graph, nowadays the growth comes from aquaculture and large parts of the aquaculture rely uh, on additional feeds, often coming from the agricultural sector itself. And so this comes from Trell et al, published in PNAS in 2014, uh, where he summarizes the use uh, of the agricultural outputs as inputs to the aquaculture. And also the numbers in absolute terms are not negligible. Actually, here in 2014, it represented only 4% of the overall feed use of agricultural crops. So not su such a big amount given the levels of production which we have seen. But, and this is the last and final reason why it's important to uh, carry for us about this, is that indeed all the projections which we have uh, available nowadays about the future seafood demand are actually predicting uh, at least a linear, sometimes even a, ex not exponential, but more than linear uh, growth. And as we have seen in the previous figures, there is a very large probability that most of them will come again from aquaculture rather than from the wild uh, fisheries. So again, a very important link to the land. So that's based on all these facts, uh, we got convinced that we have to enrich uh, this Globio model, which was focused on the land, also by the sea, uh, both catch and aquaculture uh, component of the seafood. So uh, we try to adopt a similar approach as what we had for the terrestrial systems. So we start from fishing areas, but actually are also now integrating a half degree uh, information about the availability and about the current harvest uh, of the uh, fish resources. 
uh, we differentiate relatively in detail the species. We have heard how important this is. So we are at 11 species. It's maybe not the hundreds uh, which uh, one could wish for, but uh, I think it's quite state of the art in, uh, at this level of modeling. And uh, well, then of course there are these interactions with the terrestrial sector at the level of feed, uh, inputs and so on, and the parameterization of GAG emissions. And then we have the same market representation uh, as for the agricultural and forest markets within a partial equilibrium approach. And of course, uh, these can be also substitutes for the agricultural products. So, uh, <laughs> So, uh, our aim uh, with building this was on the one hand to close the food balances, on the other hand to close the land balances, and finally also to expand uh, the assessment of sustainability from land, where we were already quite uh, well developed, also to the seas, because we see potential trade-offs. Uh, we can say, let's stop uh, deforestation in the Amazon, let's eat uh, less beef, let's substitute this by fish, but depending on where the fish comes from, uh, we can have also negative impacts uh, on other types of biodiversity, on other types of resources. So given the short time, I will show you only briefly. So this picture uh, is supposed to represent the, uh, the data structure and in the end also the structure, how we in the end translated uh, the fish and aquaculture sector uh, into the model. So we started from the FAO food balance sheets, decomposed uh, the other uses into food, feed, uh, use and other. Uh, complemented by the composition to aquaculture and capture from Fistat and from Eric Watson we have these partially explicit data sets. Then very important the, the fish meal and oil uh, sector to keep uh, these two in balances uh, and then of course the connection to the agricultural sector where both livestock uh, is on the one hand a consumer of the fish meals and oils and on the other hand uh, uh, the crops are providing uh, the feeds into the system. I have mentioned the 11 species. I will not go in detail here if you don't have the time. Uh, so, and this is our first scenario where we tested kind of the capabilities of the model to respond to our questions. So we indeed assumed in line uh, with the past trends uh, that there will be rather stagnation in the capture fisheries uh, in the future and expected that the, most of the future demand uh, should be satisfied from aquaculture. So this in our projections uh, got translated into uh, this development uh, across the different species groups. Uh, so here we have the past data sets and here we have the projections. Uh, so uh, since it comes from aquaculture, the biggest increase was in, was in freshwater and the other species. Uh, then the green one is the mollus and crustaceans are the blue part here. The others are more or less stagnating. Here we have the impact of these projections on the uh, change in the crop feed demand between 2000 and 2050. And so, of course, we observe that with these projections, there is more than five times uh, increase in the demand of the feeds. So we are going from somewhere around 20 million tons to over 100 uh, million tons uh, across the different uh, feed crops. And this has finally an impact within our model on the land use. So we can see that over time this leads to about 12 million expansion of the croplands, which are sourced from different uh, resources. Uh, partly from grasslands, minus 4 million hectares, uh, forests as well, minus 3 million hectares, and also from other natural lands. And finally, to conclude, uh, I was thinking uh, when we are talking at the Arctic Circle uh, conference, so say a couple of words for how this system could be relevant for the Arctic and subarctic fisheries and aquaculture, which still represent a non-negligible share in the catch fish. And so I was thinking along the lines uh, of the climate change, and we have indeed heard a lot about the climate change impacts, and depending whether in the end they can be positive or will be negative, this will have directly, as we have seen, interaction with the land use sector, because if additional supply can come, uh, for example, from the catch fisheries, uh, we can reduce some pressure on either aquaculture or the agriculture and the other way around. 
And there is also this strong link with the climate change mitigation policies, because as I understand, uh, especially the fisheries are very energy intensive. Uh, so if we uh, should implement, for example, carbon taxes on the emissions from the energy use in these fisheries, this could actually limit uh, the capacity of the sector uh, to supply uh, the food. And the other way around, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with these discussions, but uh, in uh, within my uh, team, uh, it is very popular to uh, ask for a substitution for all kinds of meats by fish. Uh, claiming that this would uh, provide substantial uh, benefits to the climate and this would obviously uh, give a great push uh, to the fish, uh, fisheries and aquaculture industries also here. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. This was the uh, last of the four lectures, so uh, I want to thank all the presenters for an excellent time management, which means that we have time for discussion. I will ask the panelists to join us, uh, the speakers to join us here up at the panel, and including Ambassador Balda. And uh, while they are preparing, please uh, think about the first questions that you want to ask. Uh, I find these, uh, found these uh, lectures very interesting, and it, they really started my resource economist's heart beating again. So uh, I could almost just talk to them myself uh, for the rest of the evening. I'm not sure they will talk to me about it. But I have a couple of questions in uh, mind, and there are questions from the audience. So I'm going to use the privilege of the chair to kind of jump in with the first question, and then I'll uh, open up for the audience. And uh, the first question is twofold. I'm going to ask Ambassador Belton uh -oh. uh, uh, for a simple practical matter. Yeah. Uh, in your long uh, tenure as a negotiator and working nationally and internationally on fisheries management issues, have you ever had the opportunity of using a model of this type? And if not, what would you see as being the value? And to the panel, I would like to ask, uh, has this model that you've been presenting today been used directly and resulted or had a direct impact on fishing policy in the past uh, few years? So please, Ambassador. Certainly when I began in this uh, business 25 years ago, uh, most of the concepts we heard tonight were not uh, in common parlance among negotiators. Um, some, uh, especially the first presentation, the notion of uh, uh, relationships among prey, predator and prey and other ecosystem relationships have become part of the models that I've witnessed in, uh, at the international level. I should clarify, I've only worked at the international level, not involved in domestic fisheries management. Um, but uh, some of these international organizations that manage fisheries uh, have 40 or 50 members, including uh, uh, countries at very different levels of economic development. And the application of these uh, types of models in these international fora become very difficult to, uh, to actually pursue. Uh, some of the, mo there's more than one model, Professor, and, uh, some of the latter ones in particular have not seen uh, having been brought to bear in, for example, determining how much blue, Western Atlantic bluefin tuna ICAT will actually allow to be harvested and by whom, that uh, we, we are not there yet. Thank you. And uh, the panel with regard to the question on the usage, uh, anyone want to jump in? Yeah, maybe just to start off with a few general remarks. Uh, the use of models in fishery science is, I would think it's fair to say, relatively slowly changing. That there are established protocols and they have been developed over decades and um, improved in the, in the practices of scientific advice that make it actually very hard to uh, jump in with a new idea and to add completely new dimensions. So it's more about refining the statistical assessment processes about uh, maybe adding small wheels and cogs here or there, then adding a completely new dimension like evolutionary change or the employment dimension. I, th I think that the system has locked itself in, uh, I think, a state that is difficult to overcome because the reliability of the models, uh, the peer review of the models, uh, um, the scientific acceptance of the model is paramount. And as a result of that, the system is not very open 
to um, to try new new dimensions. So what we are doing is pub publishing in the scientific literature these proofs of principles, and and we hope that maybe again with another time delay of ten or twenty years it will seep into the practices. Excellent, and I perfectly agree with you. This is a slow process, but the dimensions that we have seen added in these four lectures today here show us how dynamic the system is becoming, not only in terms of the global climate change, but also in terms change of the dynamic of the international station. Mm. That's another question I'm going to ask you later on. I'm going to see the audience. The gentleman in the gray uh, back there, and whoa, there's a lot of questions here. <laughs> so please uh, stand up, state your name and your institution so people know your reference. My name is uh, Magnus Ekeskog, I'm from Greenpeace uh, Nordic. Um, I found this presentation really interesting and I have so many questions, so I'm going to try to limit myself to, to one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's going to be to uh, Dickman. I, I found uh, your uh, different uh, options for harvest control rules really interesting and quite intriguing. Um, First off, uh, the one, the graph where you see FMSY is shooting up in the roof. As far as I, if I remember correctly, FMSY for Bernsey Cod is about 0.4. So it looked as it was a really high fishing mortality, if you could develop a bit on that. And then secondly, the harvest control rule called welfare. Uh, what does it entail? Is it maximum um, amount of jobs? Uh, is it maximum benefit for society? And, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that would be really Sure, with pleasure. Thank you very much for these questions. Uh, I'll try to be very brief. Um, the, the reason why the yield maximization yields a more aggressive policy, uh, fishing exploitation policy, than the profit maximization is actually obvious already from the classical yield curve analysis. Uh, the um, costs of exploitation go up with a fishing effort and therefore the profit curve peaks to the left of the yield curve. That's a general uh, feature of, of living resource exploitation. So you would expect, but it's not part of our public debate, you would expect that profit maximization is more conservative than yield maximization. It's somehow distorted in the public mind. The yield maximization comes from the ecologists. They are supposed to be very sustainability oriented. The Profit maximization comes from the economists. They are supposed to be aggressive and greedy, and that's why it's difficult to get this um, communicated, but it's a very trivial mathematical fact that if your costs go up, you shouldn't fish as heavily as when you have no costs. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is uh, the you know, social welfare. That's a notion of classical resource economics, and it includes the uh, producer's profit, and on top of that comes the so-called uh, consumer surplus. And you were asking, what is this additional element? It's basically access to a reasonably priced fish. And since we have dynamic prices in the model, um, if the supply of the resource goes up, the price goes down, and that's good for the consumers. Yeah? So this extra uh, twist makes it um, more advantageous from the perspective of the society as a whole to fish a little bit more when the state of the stock is good and that's this extra hump which we saw on the curves. Thank you. Uh, other panelists that want to add in at this point? No? The lady in black. Okay, Christina Jury, IUCN. Thank you. It was quite fascinating. I am curious, we're here in the midst of changing ocean and how do you start to add into your 50 models sort of that 20 percent for the uncertainty that is reflected by the conditions that the changing ocean is um, inflicting on our fish stock so i'm thinking you have the, the 10 20 50 percent and how do you satisfy these people do you allocate another 20 percent for the unknown impacts of what climate change may do to the evolutionary potential of a stressed fish stock Maybe biologists, that's it. Yeah, this uh, question, what climate change uh, does to our stocks, uh, that's still a very difficult question. We tend to think in uh, terms of uh, temperature, <coughs> and in northern areas, uh, indeed, uh, temperature increase uh, is positive for many stocks. What we understand uh, much less uh, is, uh, is there also enough uh, food 
that would uh, support this uh, growth. And then also something that comes from uh, physics, uh, not from uh, biology, and that's a light cycle. Because uh, this uh, very seasonally changing uh, <coughs> light cycle here in the north, that's an extra challenge uh, that uh, the resource populations uh, face. And the species that are already living here, they are adapted to it. But uh, species coming from the more southern regions, uh, they will have uh, trouble living in an environment where there's no f new production of uh, food uh, half of a year. So I, I don't know the answer to Christina's question, but I would have thought it's about more than just uh, temperature. So uh, pH is also changing. The oceans on average are about 30% more acidic than they were 150 years ago. And that's particularly true in the colder water, right, in the Arctic. They're also less saline. The salinity is going down as there's more fresh water runoff. So I would have thought there's even more uncertainty than just the temperature change that would need to be taken into account. You mean it's only the liberal complex? <laughs> Yeah, and this comes back to a little bit of what I was talking about, too. There are so many changes going on, and, and it goes so much far beyond just the fish, because you're at the phytoplankton level with, uh, with ocean acidification and with the stratification and everything. And you know all the, about this, but it's the model that we have, that we've been developing, is taken into account basically using the IPCC scenarios, and, and it's using whatever effect those have on the lower trophic and the higher trophic and the coupling of those two uh, because they are so integrated. So if something changes at the lower trophic level, it's going to have a huge impact. Well, Nico know all about that. So which again will, of course, come into what happens to the fishermen. So I mean, it's the fishers are, as you say, social welfare is great, but if there's no fish, it doesn't matter, right? Indeed, if there's no fish, it doesn't matter. We have a gentleman here in the front. and. Uh, Another gentleman here in black and blue tie. I even know his name, but I won't say it. <laughs> uh, we are running out of time, so I'm going to ask Eric any further questions. Okay, so these are two last questions from the audience, and then one final comment from me, please. Okay, yeah, so um, Eric Van Seville, Utrecht University. Um, so, one other really big difference, of course, between land based agriculture and the ocean is that in the ocean, everything moves around. So the currents themselves are an integral part of the ocean, so the ocean scape. I mean, we heard during the, the plenary that in the Pacific, that is a huge component of how tuna there are managed. Um, and it's also something that really changes in, in, in climate change, right? We talk about, well, we, we just heard temperature, ocean acidification, salinity. Ocean currents themselves are going to change, and they're going to change the connectivity. So how can you add that to your models? What, what, what do we need to do to also do that? They need to stop oh. messing up the climate. <laughs> 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 I don't know, anyone who wants to? Dr. you want to start and while we others think about the reply? I, I commend your attention to this uh, extra complexity and, and maybe with a different cast of speakers, we would have one more speaker about spatial heterogeneities and maybe the climate impacts affecting spatial heterogeneities. So I can only agree with you that this is, I think, in modern fishery science um, becoming more and more important, the 2D but also the 3D dimension of ocean currents and all the effect on the flow of, of nutrients and the uh, flow of eggs and larvae, for example, in the Barents Sea. Without the ocean currents, the Barents Sea would not be penetrated by the fish spawning in the Lofoten Islands, so they are an uh, integral part of the life cycle of Northeast Arctic cod. If these currents would change, that would mess up the life history of, of cod in a big way. Um, so, so I can only agree, that would be an additional dimension. Unfortunately, however, models um, easily get overloaded. And um, I think what we are experiencing is that we would like to add so many dimensions, but we know that we then arrive with a certain high probability at a garbage in, garbage out model. Yeah? So one, one has to be kind of judicious and maybe at this stage of science we are um, in a position to add individual dimensions to existing models rather carefully to show uh, and to, to kind of provide a qualitative semi-quantitative insights into their effects but to mix everything together and to hope that this will give us uh, then the perfect answer unfortunately would be naive. Yes, I think that my point would be uh, along similar lines. Uh, 
Maybe I was not so explicit about it when I was talking even about the land, but even there we are relying on uh, different other models and other economic models, like in that case, curb growth models, forest growth models, and so on. And we have quite good experience how to integrate information from this type of models into our economic model, but we have no ambition to model everything within one single model. So as long as there are other good models which can model the type of thing uh, you were talking about, I think the model has the capacity to include the information. Okay, we should talk then. Okay, and then the gentleman with a blue tie. Peter, University Center of the West Thank you. Um, this is more garbage in and one additional dimension, it, excuse me, and you said it's naive, I know, I have heard that. Um, but there is one dimension, uh, that's the human dimension. We heard very little about the consumer. And I just wanted a, a bit of uh, uh, um, prediction to 2050. Do you see all Chinese and, and Indian uh, consumers being beef eaters and milk drinkers? Or are all humans becoming vegans? Obviously not. Uh, what, what, how do you put in this into your model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so add in the dynamic capacity of the <coughs> consumer as well. It is much simpler. Yeah. Okay, so, well, uh, for the baselines, is relatively similar. We rely mostly on the FAO projections, and because our model is so economic one, so what we do is we try to calibrate our income elasticities so that given the economic growth, they are able to reproduce uh, for the baseline uh, the patterns as suggested uh, by the FAO experts. Uh, so we have also income elasticities, which are, of course, the, on the one hand, of course, heterogeneous across the regions, and on the other hand, dynamic over the time. So with your income growth and so on, urbanization, uh, the income elasticities are changing, and this takes care also of the heterogeneity across the different regions. But there is, of course, some level of convergence. Thank you. Now, we will be concluding this session, uh, and I want to conclude the, uh, on similar lines as we started the discussion here after the presentations, Ambassador Barton. Uh, you've heard how complex these models are, and you've seen the efforts going into it. Assume that you're going into a new negotiation. Let's make it an international one, since your experience is there. Let's assume it's between Norway and Iceland on macro. <laughs> How valuable would you think having a model in that discussion where you can put in parameters to see uh, development? Do you see a value in that for the negotiation and in what way? Uh, the short answer is yes. Anything that can help um, negotiators get to yes is something I'm interested in. Um, uh, certainly basic science uh, of the type that was practiced uh, 30 years ago was actually used in international negotiations. Uh, the old MSY concepts were part of what uh, countries uh, argued about, how do we get to MSY and then how do we allocate. Uh, but I think it, we must, as um, international negotiators now, uh, move with our scientists and researchers into a brave new world of trying to take account of the much more complex realities that we understand exist. As hard as that is, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, the negotiators need to be able to return back home and explain to uh, their superiors and to their publics uh, why it is we reached an agreement, say, between Iceland and Norway over, uh, over mackerel, and being able to show that this actually does uh, result in some longer, longer term utility and hopefully sustainability uh, for all the people involved, the fishers, the consumers, um, other stakeholders and the environment as a whole is a very valuable thing. We need, we need ultimately to teach our negotiators what we have been hearing about this evening. Thank you. That was very encouraging actually because uh, if you also assume that the stakeholders themselves took part in making the model as we were seeing here earlier then we might actually be able to reach a consensus. So I think we have a project upcoming. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank uh, Ambassador Bolton for his input and kind words. Thank you for inviting and me. And to the speakers, thank you very much for very interesting lectures and very good time control, which means that now we can leave at 19.03. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.